All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the entire universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be talking about my experience of listening to the Audible.com narration of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring as narrated by the magnificent, unbelievable, fantastic, perfect voice narrator Andy Serkis. Now Andy Serkis Many of you already know, he was the actor that portrayed Gollum in the um, Lord of the Rings movies and in the Hobbit movies. He also um, directed parts of the Hobbit movies. He's been uh, a world-renowned actor for many, many years, and, and uh, he's done these voice narrations for... I just I finished The Silmarillion a couple months ago. Before that, I listened to his version of The Hobbit. And now I have just listened to his version of The Fellowship of the Ring, and I'm telling you, folks, I go for a walk every hour. Uh, not every hour. What the fuck? I'll edit that out. I go for a walk every day in the morning for about an hour, listening to a, a, a book on Audible, right? I've been extending my walks, listening to Andy Serkis with The Silmarillion and now The Fellowship of the Ring, Listening to Andy Serkis uh, on these, I'm extending my walks to an hour and a half and two hours. I mean, that's how much joy I get out of these books. Books that I've read probably 15 times since the time I was 12 years old. In my life, I've read them over and over and over and over, but listening to his narration has given me a new appreciation for the entire story. Um, it's opened up my eyes to a lot of stuff that I'd been missing, even after 15 rereads, plus a bunch of movies that I've watched over and over. His voice narration has given me so much happiness and joy and pleasure every morning, looking forward to these walks where I can listen to him just tell me this magical story in a way that nobody else can tell it but him. I just want to tell him, first and foremost, Andy Circus, thank you for doing it. I mean, I'm sure you got paid to do it, but I know, I know how much, you know, voice narrators on Audible and stuff make. I mean, you probably, it's probably not the most lucrative thing you've done. I'm just saying, thank God you did it. You have given me something that I will treasure for the rest of my life with these narrations. Now let's talk about, um, cause I'm going to be doing, this is not a spoiler free. I mean, we'll be talking spoilers. We're going to be talking. If you're watching this, you've probably got anybody Everybody knows the story of Lord of the Rings at this point. So we're not spoiling anything. So I just want to go through some of my thoughts and feelings on the Fellowship of the Ring as I was listening to this narration by Andy Serkis. And just some of the things that stood out to me that I hadn't really noticed before in the books. Some of the ways I feel about Tolkien's writing now. Having, I mean, I was an admirer of Tolkien's prose and writing style to begin with. But now after listening to this, I just... I'm amazed at just how great it is. And I'm just going to be frank, and some of you are going to disagree with this, but I think that even, I think modern fantasy writers today, we, we are falling woefully short of capturing in our fantasy novels the magic and sense of wonder and sense of history and just the great overall word choice and prose that Tolkien used in his stories. I mean, and I'm throwing myself as a professional writer into this group of people that have failed to match what Tolkien did in his stories. And a lot of you will be like, eh, it's dry, it's over, it's purple prose, it's just antiquated writing. And I'm like, no, I mean, we need to, us fantasy writers, and you know that I read a shit ton of fantasy and I review it all on this channel, and I love fantasy, and I love all the writers that I review. But I'm going to tell you, we have all, all of us, every single one of us, come woefully short of the brilliance of J.R.R. Tolkien. Even though we've all been trying to capture that and capture it, and man, some people have come close. Some of my, some of the writers like Tad Williams, I mean, 
they're up there and everything. And I praise them and I love them and, and they've changed my life in so many different ways, but nobody's changed my life quite like Tolkien, especially with this reread. And let's talk about some of the stuff. Okay, so we've talked about the way he writes. I, you, you, you know I love that. And Andy Serkis has um, just emphasized to me just uh, how much I love the way this guy writes. I, I just, I love the way Tolkien writes, and I know some people hate it. But, I'm, I mean, if you're one of the people that hate the way Tolkien writes, I mean, it just must be painful. It must hurt to be so fucking wrong all the time. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, um... Rant over, uh, and you can and you can crap on me in the comments if you disagree. But if you disagree, I, again, it just must hurt to be so wrong all the time. Anyway, okay, so uh, some of the things about the story that I was noticing as I was listening to this on my walks. And by the way, when I go for walks, I live in Utah, and I walk. My house is right near the mountains, and I walk through some of the most beautiful. Rocky Mountain, high alpine landscape stuff in the world. And just, there's no better place to listen to Tolkien than when you're outdoors in nature, walking through some of this stuff. You feel like you're in the fellowship. You feel like you're Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin leaving the Shire and going out on a journey together and just going to all these different places. And as I was walking, by the way, if you want to listen to this, walk while you're doing it because you... You get the sense of how far these people are traveling. The Fellowship of the Ring is traveling. How far these guys, I mean, and, and the journey they take, it just is, it just never ending. And there's just, everything is in the way. And um, everything is out to get them. And, and the evil is just chasing them at every foot, step of the way. And I, I didn't appreciate, I guess, the vast expanse of landscape that these characters had traveled through until I started listening to this book with the narration while I was walking, pretending I was out there with them at every step of the way. And, you know, they leave the Shire. We're going to go from the beginning to the end of the book with just little bits and pieces of things that caught my attention that I really enjoyed. And the first thing was, was just the journey itself. From the moment Frodo, Sam, Pippin, and, and uh, Mary leave the Shire, and they are out walking through the Shire, and it's a long way. They are, like, traveling vast lengths of distances and stopping to sleep, stopping to camp, stopping to eat, different things. And one of the, th one of the things that I liked about Tolkien uh, this time that I hadn't caught before, but it's obvious to probably everybody but me, but the, just the foreshadowing of the Ents. Just before they even get out of the Shire... They are telling stories to each other about um, the trees and how there's rumors that the trees can move and, and speak and talk. And that sometimes they even, even as they're walking, they see that they're going through a forest and they feel like the trail is shifting before them. And it's just eerie and creepy. And then you've got the, um, the dark riders just kind of looming in the background of all of this. And they're just, they don't know. It's just a mystery. And I think we all, every guy on the planet, and maybe every girl too, has just always kind of dreamt of that um, adventure. Just going out with your buddies and going on an adventure like that where you're just kind of... And I think that's why people go into the mountains. I think that's why people go hunting. I think that's why people do the things that they do in the wilderness. It's for that sense of adventure. And J.R.R. Tolkien really, 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 really captures that just from the start. And he's relentless with it till the end of Fellowship of the Ring. Just this massive journey that people take. Um, and as they're walking through, I, I, everything is dangerous to them. The, the birds that the birds above they don't know if they're spies and this of course gets a little bit more intense as the fellowship is joined by other characters and they're going up into the real tall mountains and then into the forests and rivers but anyway that's one of the things I noticed immediately was just that these characters are on a massive journey and they're walking for the most part um I enjoyed particularly. The way the characters bonded together, 
And the way that everything was like just looming above them and they all kind of knew it, but they didn't really know why. I mean, Frodo kind of knew why, nobody else really did know why. And then when they meet Strider, of course, I mean, that's when things really pick up. That's when the story really takes off and really starts to sing is, you know, I mean, yeah, they meet Tom Bobadil and they and they have the Barrow Whites and they go through some things and the, the trees swallow them. Uh, you know, like, we, that's the thing, is, is the Ents are set up so well in this book when the trees, uh, when they're talking about the trees and then the one tree actually kind of comes alive and, and starts to swallow them. I mean, it sets it up perfectly. This is the way, I mean, Tolkien knew. He was a master craftsman. He set up so many things in this book that when they that when stuff happens in books two and three, you're not surprised, or you're not, or you're, or you're kind of like, oh, I was prepared for that because of the way it was set up in Fellowship of the Ring. Um, of course, um, once they get with Strider, things really start to take off. Things really start to sing, and and the chase from uh, I know in the movie it was Arwen that uh, took Frodo to Rivendell there at the end with the chase through the with the Black Riders and stuff, but. Um, Glorfindel is the actual elf that does it, and that's a, such an intense scene as you're as you it's being narrated to you. And um, the the Council of Elrond, uh, and how the way everybody contributes to that, and the different voices. And this is the thing with Andy Serkis is he gives each character its own accent, its own voice, its own flavor. He does it's just not all monotone throughout. I mean, each person. And then when the characters, you know, there's a spot where uh. Uh, Aragorn or Strider is singing uh, the la the lament of Barem and Luthien, and and the the hobbits are all just uh, listening to this, and and the way that uh, I always used to just skim over the poetry and the songs, but the way that um, Andy Circus reads through these things or narrates these things is magical, and I listened, I was hanging on every word, and it added so much depth to the history of uh this middle earth and that's the thing and that's another thing that um i think that modern fantasy writers have just kind of we just haven't built our worlds with the same history as middle earth has with the same depth of lore everything that these characters see and touch has a history to it from the beginning when they're on that hilltop, Weathertop, where they're in the old ruins of Weathertop, or even to uh, to the end of the book where he's uh, Frodo walks up on the Ammon Head, I think it's called, what it's called, Ammon Hoth Heth, whatever, where Boromir follows him up. That's all. All of it is like an old ruin. Everything is, everywhere they go, there's history there. It doesn't matter what forest they're walking through. They come across ruins. They come across broken down things. They come across old stone huts. They come across caves. I mean, the mines of Moria, talking about something that would just scare the out of me, that would be walking through the mines of Moria in the dark, knowing that you're walking for 50, 60, 70 miles underground in a maze, a labyrinth of rock and stone and darkness, and you don't know what creatures are in there. And just when the orcs show up it's so cool and when the balrog shows up you don't know what it is and then they they uh as they're adventuring through all this and i'm gushing on i'm fanboying about this book so much in the narration i mean i just every like i said every morning i would get up and i would take a two-hour walk listening to this thing and um one of my favorite parts of the story was when they get into um Lothlorien. Now they, they've lost Gandalf to the Balrog. They're walking through Lothlorien, and we um, and we see the elves. I mean, we knew that the elves were guarded in Rivendell. Um, we knew that Elrond and those elves were guarded. Um, we knew that uh, we knew that they didn't trust humanity or the dwarves or anything. That they've suffered great hurt throughout the history of Middle Earth, and and it never is more evident than when the Fellowship finally reaches Lothlorien, and the elves there are just so wary of every person in the company, and um, to the point where they want Gimli to uh, blindfold himself. And this was a really important scene, I think, a really big character building scene, where and, and not only for the elves themselves to show how guarded and hurt that they were with the way the rest of the world has treated elves and things like that. But to just show how the fellowship really kind of bonded together when Gimli refuses to go blindfolded. So Aragorn makes the decision 
that well we'll all be blindfolded and um i just thought that was a beautiful scene the way it was done um something that i just hadn't paid attention to before and then when we get into the uh you know the river and um the end where frodo has to make that decision it's just so cool because you can see Boromir's turning. You can see it, and you can see the tragedy of it. And you know if it's not Boromir, it's going to be somebody else. I mean, the others seem to be pretty strong. Um, Boromir sort of is the weak link. Um, would Legolas ever turn? Would Gimli ever turn? Well, we don't know. The ring was powerful, and it's, and it's really giving us a sense that, yeah, I understand why Frodo made the decision he made. I understand why Galadriel and the elves are just so distrustful of everybody. I understand why everything happened in this book. There is no plot hole that I can see. Um, you know, other than the eagles, I mean, everybody says the eagles. Why didn't you just have the eagles fall? But I'm sure that there's a, me a, mes a message there or uh, a an answer to that that I, you know, but, uh, okay, maybe there's a plot hole or two. But anyway, all I'm saying is I was uh, just uh, absolutely um, enchanted by this book all over again. I felt like Andy Serkis's narration. I was reading it again for the first time. And I got a lot of different versions of the book. I mean, I've got, uh, I've got collector's versions of the Fellowship of the Ring. I've got this version that I've been holding up the whole time. I got these versions. I got, I got the original version that I bought when I was a kid. I still have that. Speaking of, uh, you know, the Daryl K. Sweet cover of them you know, at the uh, gates of uh, the Mines of Moria with the pond and the trees and the and the secret door. I mean, all of it is just so magical. And look at this great painting by John Jude Palancar. So The Fellowship of the Ring by um, Tolkien, as narrated by Andy Serkis, is just a complete masterpiece. Um, cements in my mind why um, on every single best of fantasy book ranking i do the lord of the rings always finishes number one it just it, because it is it is number one um i mean and there's others that have come close i mean tad williams i got robert jordan i got brandon sanderson i got george rr R. martin over there i mean i've even got myself um we've all tried but none of us have come close to the to the master that's what i'm saying None of us. Anyway, 10 out of 10. If I could give it 100 out of 10, I would. So let's give it 100 out of 10.